what do I want to do? Um, oh, nice jacket, great, brilliant. Okay, people can see and hear me, that is great. Um, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about COVID-19, how that's affecting us as uh, property investors, um, and really take any questions uh, that you guys uh, may have. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how it's affecting your existing property businesses and what happens after this, because uh, the way I see it is the property market uh, is just going to pivot. Uh, is go and what would have worked in terms of investment strategies just a few weeks ago before the COVID-19 crisis simply won't work anymore. So you've got to completely rethink what you're going to be doing in, in property. Uh, stuff that won't work, I mean, particularly stuff like rent to rent. Rent to rent is a finished strategy, folks. Anyone telling you otherwise is, uh, uh, well, I can <laughs> say a lot about that. Why is, it, why is it a finished strategy? Well, let me just um, go into that a little bit more. Um, it is not the best thing for you to be doing in a market um, that we're going to see coming out of COVID-19. After COVID-19, we're going to be in a recessionary market. A recessionary market is that means that prices will be down a little bit. There will be more properties for sale, both commercial and residential, and prices will be depressed just a little bit. And they will be depressed until I feel the employment market recovers to what it was pre-COVID-19. And that creates a small window of opportunity where the supply and demand equation is in your favour and it allows you to have really a lot of fun. And in those sort of market characteristics, you want to be buying stuff. You don't want to be just you know, looking after someone else's and getting yourself a job. You want to be buying distressed assets at great prices, negotiating great deals, because, those are the, the, because fortunes are made in recession. And by buying at that sort of time, you really maximize uh, your entry into the property, mar property market at the right stage in the cycle. OK. Um, I'm getting a few comments about the sound. Uh, I will try to uh, clear that up a little bit, the best I can. Um, but I'd, uh, hang on a second, let me just play around with the little levels here. Hopefully that will have improved things a little bit. So let's have a look at uh, some of the questions that are, that are coming in. Um, um, now people are, uh, I've had a lot of questions about um, price movements and um, you know some people are thinking that you know, it's going to be massive doom and gloom someone wrote in a comment I can't remember who but someone talked about uh, am I expecting a 70% fall um, well no I'm not uh, at the moment we're in a little bit of a funny space right now um, a funny space right now because there's simply no transactions going on surveyors can't go out and survey property um, and because of that, lenders have uh, changed their terms and conditions. They've generally lowered their loan to values. And this is all because of the current lockdown situation. Uh, and of course, there's little transactional activity going on in the uh, marketplace uh, with, with limited viewings going on and all the rest of it. So we are in an unreal place right now, a bit of a twilight zone, to judge anything on the property market. Uh, the fundamentals of the UK are still solid. Uh, the fundamentals of the property market are still solid. The other thing that's happened because of COVID-19 is the effect on um, uh, new housing supply pipeline. Uh, most development projects have stopped. Um, most development projects are having issues to do with refinancing and their bridging lenders and their development financiers and the like. Uh, most property projects or larger development projects to bring on new supply of housing have been temporarily mothballed until this crisis is over. So as a result, there's still a huge amount of pent-up um, demand, uh, and, and there isn't enough housing supply to meet it. And whether prices fall too much will purely be dependent on uh, the employment situation, which we're hoping will um, recover pretty fast, because at the end of the day, we don't have enough people in the UK for the jobs that are available. We're going to see a blip. We're going to see a blip in the employment market for the next year. We're going to see a blip, and that will correspond to a blip in housing prices over the next year. Hence our uh, little bit of an opportunity. Um, now, let me just see what people... Um, uh <laughs> people are talking about... Um, 
uh, AC, um, oh right, yes, uh, you're talking about uh, hair, yes, the, the lockdown is, listen, um, uh, what I do, uh, people are talking about hair growing and all of that, the one thing I don't want is my property to take a haircut, um, I know I desperately need one, but I don't want my property portfolio to take a haircut, at the end of the day, we're in, a, as I said, a little bit of a twilight zone, and the important thing for people with properties to make sure you hold on to onto them. Uh, hopefully you went into this crisis with a bit of reserves and you're able to kind of deal with the cash flow issues of just maintaining your properties, keeping them ticking over. Um, people have talk, a lot of people have talked about should you apply for a um, deferment on mortgage interest payments. Now we have, we have applied for mortgage interest uh, deferments on our uh, mortgage payments. Um, and we've had it in writing from our mortgage lenders that it doesn't affect your credit, it doesn't affect anything at all. There's no record of it kept, provided it's, it's, it's paid back at the end of the deferment. And what that simply does, it allows you to uh, maintain a buffer so that you can keep things moving along um, and, and, and just come out the other end with your property portfolio intact. That's the, uh, that's the main thing, really. Um, Okay, I'm getting a little bit about the sound. Uh, next time I do this, I will uh, properly set up the tech so that we don't have all of that. Um, uh, Leon Dyer, I'm honestly hoping for a big drop. A lot of me too's. I guess these are, uh, I mean, I guess whether you're looking for a price drop really, really depends on where you are in your investment game. If you've been doing it a long time and you've got a bit of a portfolio, obviously that's not something that you want. But if you're new to the game, um, you might see that as a good entry point. But quite frankly, I wouldn't bother really. I don't think it's going to drop that dramatically. What you're going to see, and this is the point that you need to grab hold of, what you're going to see over the next year, I believe, is a massive imbalance between supply and demand. There'll be a lot more stock coming onto the market than there are um, uh, people who will want to uh, buy those properties. Um, so so w what does that mean then? Um, that means that uh, when, there's the, when supply and demand is in your favour, that means that P if you don't have much financing available, you can play some very interesting games. And the interesting games that really come into play are things like vendor financing options, delayed completion strategies, using lease options and option agreements to buy things. You see, one problem I have in the southeast of England when the market is very buoyant is that it's it's, it's very hard to get a vendor to accept a delayed completion or a lease option agreement or something like that because there's another buyer with cash that's willing to put it on the table. Now we're in a situation where the supply-demand imbalance will be in the buyer's favour. So if there's no one else with a credible offer uh, for a particular property and you come up with, a, with, a with an offer saying, look, um, I'll give you an option to buy it, um, dependent, and we'll exercise that option, dependent on us getting planning or um, a certificate of um, a prior approval for, for doing some permitted development work on it. Um, these are the types of sort of low-risk uh, entries that people can make into the property market at this time. So someone asked me a question about what do you do if you've got 100 grand and you want to get into property. Well, if you've got 100 grand and you want to get into property, um, I would be looking and learning about how to source properties. Um, we're in a lockdown, a lot of estate agents are in lockdown. It's very difficult to get anything out of estate agents right now. Remember, a lot of these staff have been furloughed. And the other thing about the furlough scheme is um, what impact it has on people who work in jobs where most of their remuneration is through commission. If you've got a low basic and most of your money is through commission, you know, you're, you're kind of devastated. And a lot of these negotiators and estate agents are in this sort of position. So a lot of them aren't doing too much right now. But there is um, a golden opportunity, and we've already activated um, some direct-to-vendor marketing campaigns uh, to really kind of target vendors of properties um, where you can make a direct approach. Now, when you're making a direct approach to a vendor, and they don't, and they are motivated to sell, and they don't have too many options um, of other buyers available. Then you can pitch them um, a competitive offer, and you can pitch them an offer which is subject to. And I think this is the phrase that's going to really uh, turbocharge your property investing career: the phrase "making offers subject to." So you see a site, 
um, it's got some permitted development rights that you can exercise or some planning permission um, improvement rights that you can exercise and you make the offer subject to getting the planning permission. You get the planning permission, you exercise your option to buy the property off the vendor, you give the vendor what they want and you have an immediate uplift on day one even in a um, flat, flat market. Uh, and that is a golden opportunity for people right now. Right, let me have a look at some of the uh, questions. We've talked about the large drop. Um, um, how long, how, how big do you think the drop, Jonathan Skel Shel um, uh, Shek Shekleton is asking me, how big do you think the drop will be and for how long? Um, I think the length of time of the drop is dependent to the employment market. As soon as, what we're seeing is a little bit of a merry-go-round in the jobs market. I mean, we run a serviced office building and um, a lot of our uh, tenants um, have uh, exercised their uh, right to um, basically end their, li end their license agreements. Um, so what we, w what we are seeing is that um, some people who, would, who had an eight-person suite uh, want to come back at the l after the lockdown but only take a five-person suite. Um, so people, businesses will come back after the lockdown, but a lot of them may contract a little bit, whereas before the lockdown they were expanding a little bit. So it's going to take a little bit of time until the economy starts firing again on all thrusters, and a lot of the, um, uh, the un 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 unemployment that it will create kind of gets mopped up. Uh, when that gets mopped up, then you will see a rapid recovery in housing. And I think we're looking at a 12-month period, assuming we don't get a massive spike in uh, coronavirus, which of course is the elephant in the room which no one really knows about. Um, um, now, I, 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 uh, let's have a look at what some other folks are saying. People are talking about interest rate. Daniel is saying, I truly think increasing interest rates uh, slowly over the past five years would have massively saved this drama. I don't exactly know what you mean. If you want to elaborate on that, please do so in the, uh, in, in the comments. Um, uh, would you suggest pushing... Um, uh, Prithvi Raj uh, Rao is asking me, would you uh, suggest pushing down on buying price right now or waiting three or four months to do it? Well, right now, quite frankly, I would be looking at sourcing deals, sourcing opportunities, uh, mostly from direct-to-vendor opportunities, and looking at stuff that is has been on the market for at least three, four months. Uh, because anyone that had put their property on the market in January and still hasn't sold it, uh, they must be getting more and more in need of that sale. But I wouldn't be making any offers today while we're in lockdown. It's the old saying about you never want to catch a falling dagger. Wait till the dagger has, has fallen on the ground and you can pick it up safely and then you can go. Um, this crisis is quite different from any other recession that I've uh, worked in. Like in 2008, 2009, when the uh, Lehman's Brothers crash happened and the credit crunch happened, we were looking at the uh, unfolding crisis in the rear view mirror. The crisis had happened and then we um, as uh, citizens, as people in the property investor, in, in, in property community, were just reacting to those events. This is the first crisis that I've seen it, where the crisis is not in the rear view mirror. It's actually happening right now. And until it's over, until we're out of lockdown and we see some normality return, it is going to be very, very difficult to make offers. I think it'll be very, very foolish to make offers right now, um, unless, of course, no, re really, I'm not making any offers right now. I am um, getting conversations with vendors, uh, uh, qualifying them to see how motivated they are, and looking for easily realizable development opportunities which can be exploited on those sites. <coughs> the offers will start to um, generate after uh, the lockdown is over. Um, uh, can we talk about business, Leon Dyer? What aspect of business do you want me to talk about? If you just elaborate on that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, what loan to value would you say is optimal? Um, well, I think um, in some ways that's going to be guided by the banks. Um, we have already seen a drop in loan to values. Um, and those loan to values will be even less for commercial property purchases. Uh, but I think for commercial properties, you're looking at 60% for, 
for residential properties is going to be about 70% uh, after, the, after we come out of uh, lockdown. And really, the, I think the question that Daniel Graf is asking me is what LTV is optimal. Well, I have a different view on this depending on where we are in the property market cycle. Now, when property prices are depressed, we're going to be in a recession. Make no doubt about it. So the only properties you want to be buying are ones that you can add value to through your own efforts, usually because you have bought them below market value, you can tart them up a little bit, or you can add value through development, either permitted development or planning gain. Um, because if you're going to sit there buying a property, waiting for natural capital appreciation, you're going to be forever. Um, so I wouldn't bother doing that, quite frankly. Uh, you want to be doing stuff where you can add value, you can force appreciation, irrespective of the what the market is doing. Now, against that backdrop, um, wh particularly when you're buying distressed properties from motivated sellers, my view is maximize your LTVs, because you've got a window of opportunity where supply and demand is in your favor. So maximize the opportunity there, take advantage that the supply and demand equation is on your side, and pick up as many distressed assets from motivated sellers as you possibly can uh, during these next few years. Um, personally, um, the most successful people I know um, and what we've done in our portfolio, the best assets that we've bought have been in recessionary periods. That's the time when you really want to do exactly what I've said. Um, uh, okay, let's see, let's see what other folks are saying. So just got here, I hope you haven't uh, covered property post price falls yet. Okay, we shall maybe touch on that again if uh, other people ask. I'm in a position to buy a rundown property 20% below current market value. Uh, do you think it is worth completing or not? Um, that's a good question. That's a very specific question. I'm in a position to com buy a rundown property 20%. Now, the key words there are rundown. Uh, now, what happens with rundown property in a recession? We, before COVID-19, we had a Boris bounce. Things were looking pretty good in the property market, quite frankly. Now, in good times, the differential between rundown property and A1 property shrinks. In bad times, in recessionary times, th there's a massive gulf that opens up in price that you pay for a rundown property and a done-up property. We see this all the time. I mean, in boom time, you know, you buy some wreck at auction and it's about the same price as, a, as, a, as, as one that's fully done up. That's just the way it is. Supply and demand is not on your side. So, what I th suspect from your question is you negotiated that deal 20% below current market value, maybe just before COVID-19. And if that's the case, then I would be looking to reassess that. Because quite frankly, in the recession that we're g we are going to see over the coming months, you will get a better discount for a rundown property. Um, what evidence do I have of this? Well, you just have to look at some of the auction data that's coming out. If you look at some of the auction sales data, you'll see um, that you're seeing a bigger gulf uh, in price that rundown property is fetching compared to the market value uh, than we had, say, this time last year or the year before. And that's worth bearing in mind. Um, OK, so let me have a look. Um, Yorkshire is the place to invest from David Burnham. Well, perhaps it is. There are lots of good pockets in Yorkshire. There's the Golden Triangle, as I understand, Leeds, Harrogate, um, you know, anywhere where you know. Um, I here's the thing about the, um, uh, the market that we're going into. There are places that are, quite frank, no offence to anyone, that, but they're hell holes, quite frankly, and they'll always be hell holes. Uh, there's no point investing in Blackpool. I mean, it doesn't it does sod all in a boom time. It does sod all in, in 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 depression times. You know, but you know what? Good solid areas where there's good solid employment prospects, where there's an affluent population, where prices have always been solid. They will see a little bit of a dip, simply because the supply and demand supply and demand equation is just in your favour, and that's the time to pile into those areas. Good solid areas that existed before COVID-19 will always be good solid areas when we come out and you've got a window of opportunity to pick up a few things. So that's what I would say with that. But David P Dvernum is basically saying, let's all pile into Yorkshire. So uh, there may be a tip there for people. Um, every micro market market is Imran Sheikh. Yes, you're absolutely right. 
Um, there's no such thing as a property market. Every, mi every micro market is completely different. Um, and, and we are seeing, um, uh, would numbers work in London if it's 20% less than advertised price? Now, that's a good question. Uh, <coughs> let's have a uh, look at what's going to happen. Now, is what's going to happen guaranteed? When this lockdown is over, we're going to see a budget. We're going to see a recovery budget. Um, and that, that budget is going to be about getting us back on our feet. Now, one thing that they love to play around with uh, during times like this is to get the property market moving. If they get the property market moving and they keep that going, then people feel good and it has a positive impact on the wider economy. So I would expect to see something on SDLT. Uh, not permanent, but temporary. You know, we may even get a lifting of this three silly 3% three uh, SDLT surcharge. We may see a reduction in um, uh, stamp duty rates uh, across the board, or a stamp duty holiday maybe. There has to be something to give this market a little bit of impetus. Um, has it happened before? Yes. Um, back in 2009, they increased the, sh the threshold at which commercial stamp duty was payable. And a lot of the properties we picked up, the commercial assets we picked up uh, post-2009 crash, um, were picked up uh, without paying any stamp duty at all because they, they gave a little bit of a period where there was a temporary stamp duty holiday. Uh, Donald Trump has just done this in the States. They're equivalent of um, SDLT. He's announced that when they come out of lockdown, uh, they're gonna be, there's going to be a holiday on that to, um, to get the real estate market moving. So what the point I'm making is that I, when we have this recovery budget, I would, see, I would expect to see some measures there uh, for real estate um, and particularly around temporary reliefs for stamp duty, which will suddenly bring back into play high value areas. Now, this, this um, person asked about London. London is a high value area, and if you're paying 3% additional st SDLT, um, that adds a lot to the purchase price. And of course, you can't get a loan on the SDLT. You can only get a loan on the, you know, the value of the property. So, um, so what, what, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that um, uh, watch out for the recovery budget, watch out for some temporary changes in stamp duty, uh, particularly changes in the 3% SDLT surcharge, and that will allow you to pick up some great distressed assets, particularly rundown places in high value areas without having to pay that surcharge, and that might be a very, very good angle uh, that'll be coming up. Um, have you managed, ah, Jared Oliver, have you managed to get any mortgage holidays from commercial banks like Handelsbanken? Do you think the governments will put pressure on commercial banks to help commercial landlords? Very good question. And this is a massive, I could do a massive rant on this. The government have given, have asked um, residential uh, mortgage lenders and residential buy-to-let mortgage lenders to give people a three-month deferment. They have not insisted um, that commercial lenders do the same. And it's been very, very much on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so I've gone to some of our commercial lenders, um, um, Norwich and Peterborough Commercial, they've said yes. Handelsbank, and, um, they said yes. HSBC, they said yes. Um, who said no? Interbay said no, um, or they're thinking about it. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a mess with commercial, and it really is going back to your relationship manager and see what you can uh, uh, negotiate. And, you know, I tell you, if this lockdown carries on, which I don't think it will, for more than two commercial quarters, that could, and they don't introduce some relief for commercial landlords, that could see uh, real trouble in the, uh, in, in, in the commercial sector. But a good question. Uh, Leon Dyer, I'm a cash buyer. Very, very good. Um, what I would recommend, though, is this to cash buyers. Um, pretend that you don't have much money. You know, because here's the thing with being a cash buyer. Um, over the next year, there'll be great deals out there. Uh, and you've got this window, I, I think it's going to last two to three years, where you can really have some fun. And you know, it takes time to do a deal. So it's about doing as many deals as possible within those two or three years where there's a massive window of opportunity. And if you ha have all cash, it can turn you into a very lazy uh, property investor. Because you use all your cash, you tie it up in a deal, um, you do something to the property, you rent it out, you perhaps refinance it, and a year later, you're doing the next one. 
But what I would advise you to do, if you've got cash, is to pretend you haven't got any. So, um, look at parceling that up into smaller pots and looking at using creative financing techniques so that you can use this three-year window of opportunity to make your cash go much further and do a lot more deals than just doing a whole deal all cash. Um, because remember, um, I, I really believe, and I know from previous cycles, um, that supply demand is really in your favour. And um, if you go around saying you're a cash buyer and can complete you know, tomorrow, um, you don't need to do that element of quick completion to win the deal. Uh, because there isn't really that much competition out there. Um, uh, also, how do you find investors? I guess that's a whole topic in itself. I think the classic question people ask is, do you find the deal first or the investor first? Um, uh, my approach is to let people know uh, what we're doing. Um, I, I've worked a lot with private investors, really up until about 2014. We're just starting that up again, and it's about fostering the relationships, letting people know what you do, um, letting people know the kind of projects you do and the way that they can get involved. Um, what I find with um, private investors is about the relationship first. Um, you've got to be able to um, get on. You've also, you've ob you've ob you've also got to be able to um, kind of gel a little bit in, in, in the investment approach and the investment strategy, and then everything kind of flows. So my advice is work on the relationship first, um, uh, then uh, 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 and then uh, the the specific uh, opportunity. Um, okay, now let's just see see whether I can. Um, thoughts on rent control, Sadiq Khan, uh, to manage this through London. Oh, I don't think that will happen. I think uh, Sadiq Khan will have a big, big difficulty in doing that. Um, listen, I think um, you know. I, I really don't think we'll, that will. Uh, that will that will happen, and I think in property you can spend a lot of time focusing too much on what may happen and could happen. And if I'd spent a lot of time doing that, you wouldn't have really got anything done. Um, and I urge people to just focus on the opportunity. Um, and the other thing is, if you buy well, if you buy well, um, our strategy has been to buy well, dis buy distressed assets. Um, do a lot of commercial to conver residential conversion, but we've kept them for rental. Um, quite frankly, if Sadiq Khan decided to do um, rent control and he got away with that, we'd be looking at selling some of those. I mean, there's a lot of profit built in, so you know, sort of why not? If you do a good deal, if you um, buy property that you can add value to straight away, by adding value straight away, you preserve your option um, because you've got profit in the deal itself. If someone changes the game, changes the rules of the game, brings in something like rent control, for example, and you don't like that, then you decide whether or not you want to play anymore. It's as, it's as simple as that. Um, and someone's agreeing with me, Milton, Interbay, mortgages are making it very hard to give you a holiday on commercial buy to let. Uh, they want to know why and prove you are in stress. Well, maybe I'll try some blood pressure readings and uh, and see what they uh, they say about that. Uh, I'll have to get a monitor in and and and, and send them a, a printout or something. Who knows? Um, okay. Can I use um, um, uh, Clive Ferguson? Can I use cross collateral bridging loan from my residential property to finance and refurb commercial property? Yes, you can. Um, if you get a um, commercial, if you, well, if you get any loan on a residential property. Um, once you've got the money and they've approved you for the funding, yes, you can use it for um, whatever purposes you need. Um, yep, Leon is agreeing with me. Boris wouldn't allow rent control. I hope he does not. Um, Daniel, uh, Ranjan, please can you explain what you mean by vendor financing? Well, uh, what I mean by that is essentially you need a deposit. You need equity to buy a property. The bank will give you so much and the rest you need to put up, you need to come up with some money from somewhere. That equity, normally people think of as a deposit that you put down on a property. Now what happens if, let's say the bank gives me 60% and I need 40%, instead of me putting up 40%, what happens if I could get the vendor to basically give me 30% and I put up only 10? Wouldn't that be a more um, cash efficient way of financing that transaction? Well, yes. Well, how would I get the vendor to give me that? Well, 
Um, the way I, I love to do it, and the way I kind of do it, particularly in these times in the cycle, is I look for properties which have planning gain or permitted development opportunities. So let's say we do a lot of shops and uppers, for example. Let's say we buy a freehold property which comprises a shop and some upper floors. Um, now, we may offer a price um, for that property subject to us getting prior approval to implement our PD rights to make some flats at the top and uh, maybe one at the back and that kind of thing. Now, we secure that property with an option from the vendor at a fixed price. As soon as that prior approval, it takes 56 days to get prior approval, as soon as we win that prior approval and we have that piece of paper to say that we have got it, we have immediately uplifted the value of that property. So what we can then do is go to a bridging finance here and say, look, we're going to buy this property. We've secured it from the vendor at this price. We've got this permitted development in place. Uh, value it on the fact that it's got effectively a green light to build three flats on the site. They will obviously value that at higher than the price we are purchasing the property for. And in effect, that is vendor financing because uh, y the value that you've created in the property before actually buying it you're using to replace what you would have normally had to provide in a cash deposit. And that allows your funds to go a lot, lot further at times like this. Um, right, now, where, what else am I uh, getting asked here? Um, vendor for financing, I've talked a little about claim financing. Oh, is there, this is a lovely one, Ben Edwards, is there a six-month rule in commercial property? No. Uh, the great thing about commercial property is uh, if you've added value to it, you can refinance it the next day. And the other great thing about how commercial property financing works is it's all like the old days. It's you have relationship bankers. And um, my relationship bankers, they come around and see the property. And quite frankly, if you've bought a property for 100 grand and you've added value to it and, and their own value has valued it at, say, 180 and you want to refinance it, they look at that as, as your skill in what you do as a property investor, that their own value has valued it at a lot more than you purchased it at. And that strengthens the relationship. So commercial property lending is completely different. No six months rules apply. So you can have a lot of fun uh, with that. So I've only got a few, um, a little while longer, because I'm going to wrap up before eight. We've got the NHS um, uh, clap, which I think we should all get out and do. So we'll stop um, in a, uh, about, about 10, 15 minutes time. Um, okay, th hi, thanks for the live Q&A. Um, I hope people are enjoying their tipple, by the way. Let me know in the comments what your tipple is for this uh, little live Q&A. Um, will um, remortgaging be an issue if, Sean Mukherjee, it will remortgaging be an issue if mortgage holidays have been taken? I said this at the beginning of the, uh, the call. Um, we've taken these mortgage holidays, these deferments, and I've been assured in writing by the lenders that we have for residential buy to let, um, that is all fine basically. It doesn't get entered anywhere, it doesn't get recorded anywhere. Um, my intention is that once this crisis is over, we'll basically pay it all off in one lump sum. The idea of the deferment is to have the funds there as a flexible buffer, just in case, uh, because who knows uh, what, can, what can happen. It seemed prudent to do so. Um, okay. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. G is asking me about commercial tenants, asking for three months rent free. Have you heard this happening and what are your suggestions as a landlord dealing with this? A very, very good question. Um, absolutely correct. Uh, the government have basically, um, commercial property has been great as a buy to let investment because even little old me, if I'm letting a commercial property to some giant worldwide corporations, I have a huge amount of power. If they don't pay the rent, uh, I can just march in there, send in a bailiff without uh, going to court, seize their goods, and I can forfeit the lease after 21 days of non-payment. So commercial property is a game where there's no David and Goliath. Even if you're dealing with uh, international giants, you have a huge amount of power. What the government have done is they've said to tenants that there is a three-month moratorium on landlords forfeiting the tenant's lease. So basically, we have got a three months in, uh, as a commercial landlord where we can't say to the tenant, look, pay up or you're out. So this puts us in a little bit of, a, bit, of a, bit of an issue because some 
what we have found is the mom and pop tenants, the smaller tenants have paid up, but some of the big uh, multinationals are preserving their cash and they're coming up with excuses. Some are sending cheeky letters to all their landlords. I mean, Coral have done this, uh, Costa have done this, um, a few of the other, uh, Reed Recruitment have done this, a lot, a few of the big names that we deal with have, have sent out these blanket letters to all their landlords saying, hey, um, uh, one, one, one of these guys even asked for a six-month rent-free period. Now, um, they're sending out these letters to all their landlords. What it depends on is the strength of your position as a landlord. Now, if you've attended any of my commercial property workshops, you'll know what I teach is that you should buy commercial property that has alternative uses. So you may have a tenant in there, but if that tenant were to go, you have alternative uses for that property because you can convert some or all the space into residential use or you've got an alternative commercial use uh, for that space. Uh, and that is the key. If you've got a site where there's no other use for it or there's no, you can't convert anything to residential, there's no PD rights, there's no other tenant that would want to occupy that place, well, you're stuffed, aren't you? You're absolutely stuffed. What are you going to do? Then, the, then the, um, the boot is on the tenant's foot. Um, they can say, look, you know, can we have a rent-free period? And you've got no alternative. Um, but w we're in a very strong position, my students are in a very strong position, because what I've advocated is to buy properties with alternative uses. So uh, we're writing back to them and saying, no, um, you need to pay up. Uh, and if they don't want to pay up, we're in a better position by having the property empty, because those sites we have purchased because they have permitted development rights. That means we can convert all or s most of the space to residential usage and we, it'll be worth more if we do that than if the current tenant stays. So that's the, 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 the line and the position of the commercial landlord is really dif dependent on the strength of the portfolio they hold, um, the, the, the location of those assets and whether or not they have um, alternative uses. Those are very, very key, but an excellent, excellent question. Um, the uh, people, water, rum and coke, oh, good tipples. No one's got um, a bottle of, uh, of Prosecco. Well, I haven't had the whole bottle, by the way. I'll just uh, clarify that before anyone um, accuses me of anything. Okay, um, um, Jared, we work equals uh, no difference to Re um, Regis. Now with all the hype stripped away and the top honcho cashing out, I personally doubt it will survive. Um, um, okay, uh, I think there's some general comments about the serviced office market. The serviced office, a lot of serviced office operators have operated on a rent-to-rent -rent model. So they rent a large office building on a full repairing insuring lease for 10 years and then they do some conversion works to make individual suites and they sublet it to um, uh, people on flexible terms. Those people are, are in a very challenging cash flow position. Uh, because quite frankly, uh, they've got the upkeep of the building to pay for, lift servicing, air conditioning contracts, waste removal contracts, IT contracts, all the stuff to keep a building going. They've got the rent payment to the end landlord, plus with COVID-19, because these uh, the serviced office tenants are on flexible leases, many of them, if they have been able to do, have um, kind of said, look, um, uh, we're, 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 we're cancelling our leases and, and the like. So the serviced office player who is doing a rent to rent model is challenged um, and the the and some of them may not survive but the thing is when we come out of COVID-19 what I see is serviced offices booming and the people who particularly the serviced office operators who own their own buildings will be in a very good position to capitalize because coming out of this how many businesses would want to commit to a 10-year lease on an office you want flexible terms. You want to go in there with a 12-month license. And we're seeing more and more large companies as well um, split their businesses up. In, instead of having 100 people in one office, they'll split their businesses up into teams and locate them in different serviced offices um, and, 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 and split up their sort of um, uh, offices like that. We're also seeing a change in people. I already saw this before COVID-19. Um, in our serviced office building, if a tenant took a seven-person suite. They may have 20 people in the company, but not all of them are there every day. They only need a core of people there in the office. The rest are remote working out on site and all the rest of it. So the way people are using offices is completely changing. And serviced offices will be a massive boom market. But I think that many of the 
rent-to-rent -rent serviced office operators will be facing some crash, cash crunching times. And there has been no government help for these guys, I tell you. Uh, really, the serviced office sector has been hung out to dry. Ranjan, I'm tempted to take on to take 150 cash and buy a couple of HMOs in Liverpool for students via auction in this current market. What are your thoughts? Um, I would shy against diving into the HMO market right now. Um, it's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I don't think co-living is something that you really want to be getting involved in. We have some HMOs, we're having problems. I mean, we've had... Some, uh, someone wanted to move out of an HMO because there's a, there's a doctor renting one of the rooms in the house and they're worried about a risk of getting infected. You know, these are sort of issues that you have to face now with, um, uh, with, with HMOs. I'm not sure whether HMOs is, is the right sort of time in the market. Uh, HMOs is um, a strategy where you make money from um, uh, cash flow from intensifying the usage of the property. In a recession, you want to make your money by buying cheap, by adding lots of value, and making capital value. You want to make a capital return on the asset that you're buying. Um, it's not a time for wasting a lot of time making your money by putting in all your work and energies into intensifying the cash flow. Intensify the value uplift from the asset. That's really where you should be focusing all your strategies going forward uh, for the next few years. Um, do you think serviced offices are old speckled hen? I like that as well. I should have had a bottle of that. Um, uh, do you like serviced offices? Way to go. Yeah, I think uh, that's going to be phenomenal when we uh, come out of all of this. Um, can you, this is an interesting, burning desire. Can you become a millionaire in the long term buying 10 houses down north, down north or up north, producing £500 a month? No, 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 no. Uh, let me reiterate, um, um, the people who achieve massive wealth through property make it through capital gain. Um, that's the bottom line. Uh, the people who, uh, the, the, cap the, the cash flow is just to keep the property ticking over and to give you some living expenses and all the rest of it while you're waiting for capital gain. Recessions allow you to the opportunity to build that capital gain in a very short space of time. Um, that's, the, that's, the strat that's where fortunes are made, by buying distressed assets cheap uh, at times of, uh, of, 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 of recession. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm looking at cash flow, but I'm not looking at spending a lot of time on it. Obviously, everything has to be cash flow positive, otherwise, what's the point in doing it? But what you're looking at is basically um, uh, buying, I mean, everything I bought between 2009 and 2013, within a year of buying it, I had no money tied up in the property because we bought cheap, we added value, we refinanced, pulled everything out, went on to the next one, and you built up a portfolio that within 10 years pretty much increased in value quite a bit. Um, and that's really the opportunity fo to focus on. That will happen again. Um, and that's the thing to, uh, to kind of spend your time on. Um, if you were a first time buyer in London, would you hold off from buying right now and wait until the end beginning of next year? Also, how do you, okay, uh, and what do you expect? Now, I'm not a big fan of waiting really for anything. Uh, I've said, s I, I've just contradicted to myself, of course. I will wait until COVID-19 lockdown is over because I want the dagger to fall. I want the dust to settle. I want us to come out of lockdown and see what it's all like. Um, you know, um, we, 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 yeah, we've got, we got, we got to see that first. Um, I, sometimes you see these um, on Sky News and all of that. You see some cyclone or some hurricane happening in some part of the world. And the Sky News reporter is there in the middle of the hurricane and they're holding their hat and the brolly is um, going all over the place and they're, uh, and, and they're swaying all around in the wind and they're giving their live report as the hurricane happens. And you're watching it on telly. It doesn't look that bad. It just looks like a rainy storm. You watch the news report the next day when the hurricane has happened and it's been. Then you see the devastation. You see the buildings collapsed. You see the wood debris all over the place. You see the teddy bears and... Um, personal possessions all over the streets and uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, what I'm saying here is we're in the middle of the hurricane and the cyclone. Let's wait until it settles down first. Uh, let's wait until the hurricane's over and we can see the lay of the land. Then we can start thinking about buying. Now, when it's settled down and the daggers fall on the floor, then we can think about picking it up. My view is don't wait. 
my view is once things have settled, all you're looking at is buying it significantly cheaper than what it is at that point in time. And all you're looking at is that it doesn't fall further than that. That's really um, uh, pretty much it. Um, first time, I think first time buyers will have tremendous opportunities um, in London. Uh, I started out in the 1990s in a, in a real recession market and I was making subject to offers. So I was, I was doing stuff where I was um, making offers on properties. Uh, I was having delayed time frame between exchange and completion. I was even carrying out works in between exchange and completion, getting them revalued and then completing based on a higher price. These sort of strategies um, are, are still up for grabs uh, today um, and there are all sorts of ways of doing them you know, with bridging and then an end loan at the end. Uh, okay, I haven't got too much time. Someone's having a JD and Coke. Liverpool is saturated with over... Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's been a massive jump to HMOs recently and everyone has gone for HMOs where there's the lowest barriers to entry. So let's buy a place in Hull, let's buy a place in Liverpool or wherever it is. Um, there are too many of them, there are not enough tenants and you're going to suffer. I know many of our Baker Street property meet attendees who've got portfolios in the Midlands and um, Hull I've heard, um, also in Liverpool, are actually converting HMOs back into single family lets and even letting them out to housing associations and that kind of thing, simply because uh, with an HMO like that in a low value area, you only need one or two rooms empty uh, and you're stuffed. It's not really um, that great after all. And if you're doing rent to rent serviced accommodation, well, that's a strategy for yesteryear. We don't really want to talk about that. Complete baloney. I wouldn't do touch those. Now, if you're in rent to rents, I mean, I know a lot of people, I've got some people on my mastermind program who have uh, been into rent to rents. They're unwinding those and they've unwound those at exactly the right time because they are really um, coming home to roost now. Um, okay, uh, yeah, Ranjan loves Hull. I've never actually been to Hull, actually. I know I make a lot of uh, uh, jokes about that. I g generally mean uh, up north and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, now, um, let's have a look here. Uh, what else have we got? Um, oops, these things are just scrolling up and down. Um, Ranjan, would it be worthwhile looking at residential properties with development potential? Um, uh, uh, yes, definitely, yes, again, again. <coughs> if you see a site with development potential, whether it's residential and it's owner-occupied, that's another time for what I call the subject to offer and, and negotiating the deal with an option agreement. Because remember, if the vendor is in the property, they're living in the property, and there's no other game in town. Uh, let's say the property is available for 100 grand, and perhaps it's on a corner plot with a little bit of s li um, land at the back. Um, so you know, what we do in those sort of situations is we'll say to the vendor, look, you want 100 grand. No one expects to get the asking price in this market. We'll give you 100 grand. But we will offer it, we, we, will, we, will, we will actually purchase the property in six months' time um, once we've got planning permission to do what we want with the side plot or what have you. Um, we'd secure the site at 100 grand by way of an option. We'd risk our capital in terms of planning permission and planning fees and architect fees to get that work done. Once that planning permission is got, um, we will then exercise our option to buy it and we'll get financing based on that uplifted value. It's a superb time to play that game because when that game is really possible, when properties take longer to sell. In an up market, you can't do that because people will buy the property unconditionally. Because there are fewer buyers available willing to make those unconditional offers, it allows relatively new entrants with the knowledge and the skill uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the sort of um, playbook, if you like, uh, to go in and make creative offers so that they don't really have to put too much uh, in the game. By the way, the other thing about that strategy, when I started out using that strategy, I would also, um, so you've secured the property with an option, you're risking your money getting the planning permission, and you're only exercising that option in six months' time. That six months' time gives you plenty of time to work with private investors and get some private investors on board who, may, who, who will finance the development of that particular project and you can cut them into an equity split and the like. So the fact, what I'm trying to say here is the fact that property takes longer to sell 
and there are fewer buyers out there, no matter whether it's residential or commercial. What that does is it opens up the game to people without much cash um, who are equipped with the knowledge and the toolbox of strategies to, to, to make the market work for them. Um, and that's really the bottom line. In a heated market, you can't do all this stuff because there's always someone with cash willing to transact. And you know you just sort of lose out on all of this sort of stuff. Um, okay. Uh, oh, good question, Ash. Um, what happens if the vendor pulls out of the option? You can't. Uh, option agreements have been in place for donkeys of years. They've tried and tested in court. Um, uh, if it's a properly done option agreement for a solicitor, you the the vendor cannot pull out. Um, simple as. Uh, that's just as clear as day. Get it done for a solicitor and uh, you do have to make sure that when the vendor signs the option agreement they get independent legal advice so they understand the document that they're signing and all of that sort of stuff and then it's all clear. Try to test it in court, don't worry about that. Um, these are not stuff that I've made up, they've been going on for since before I was born anyway so um, th that's not a problem. Um, okay, I we've got a few more, a couple of minutes before we uh, kind of wrap up. Listen, I think we are going to wrap up. Oh, thank you for your comments and feedback on this live Q&A. Now, next week, we've got the Baker Street Property Meet. It's going to be live, uh, and um, to register for it, just head on to bakerstreetpropertymeet.com. It's absolutely free. It takes place on Wednesday, 29th of um, April. Um, when you register, we'll send get you an email out with some links uh, to let you know how you can interact uh, with us uh, live during the Baker Street Property Meet. We've got three terrific guests. Uh, we've got Shaf Razul. Shaf Razul is uh, from Scotland. He used to be on Dragon's Den Online. He's quite a prolific uh, commercial property investor. He started a YouTube channel. You may have seen him do all sorts of exposés on um, uh, various people in the uh, sort of property sector. He's got a bit of traction on that. Um, so he'll be talking about, I mean, our theme for this Baker Street Property Meet is really what are these people going to be, what are these people doing now during COVID-19 and what are their top tips for uh, investing once we come out of lockdown. So uh, Shaf Razul will be giving his view. Uh, the second guy who you'll all know, Simon Zushi, um, founder of the PIN uh, Property uh, Meetups, uh, been investing in property a very, very long time. Uh, he's got a big handle on creative strategies as well. Uh, he also runs a crowdfunding platform, uh, so he's very much in the financing angle too. Uh, so again, the same question to Simon. Um, what are you doing right now during lockdown? And what do you see, um, uh, how do you see yourself pivoting your property investment strategies uh, in the post-lockdown uh, environment? What will you be doing when we uh, come out the blocks? And, um, and, and, and finally, we have Mark Alexander. Al Mark Alexander is founder of Property 118, um, which is a massive site which has done a lot of good um, for, for landlord community. It's a forum site. You need to go on it and uh, register on that. It's all, it's all free stuff. Um, he uh, doesn't live in the UK anymore, um, but he has uh, several hundred properties in the UK, um, which he uh, manages and he knows a lot about what's going on. He knows a lot about how to structure your business as well. Um, the appropriate and correct structures for your property business, uh, what you should be doing with uh, thinking about uh, in terms of how you structure your property business, in particular how to maximise your returns uh, going forward when we come out of this crisis. So we got Shaf Razul, we got Simon Zushi, we got Mark Alexander all joining us in a um, great Baker Street property meet. Register for free at bakerstreetpropertymeet.com. We'll send you details of how you can interact with us uh, online. Do get us any questions uh, that you have. We should have some, uh, any questions you want to put to Samuel, uh, so not Samuel, I'm reading Samuel here, Shaf, um, um, Simon, myself, or Mark. Uh, you, can set, you can just put them in this chat window and uh, we'll try to uh, address as many as possible. So, okay, that is about it, folks. So, um, uh, I hope you like this. I'm going to be doing more of these um, sort of uh, property uh, glass of wine evenings while we're in uh, lockdown. Um, we won't do one next week because we've got the Baker Street Property Meet on Wednesday, but certainly the Thursday after. Uh, so get your bottle ready. Um, uh, it's time to sign off now. And remember, 8 o'clock, um, uh, support those guys uh, who are doing a great job. 
uh, at, the, uh, at the NHS. Uh, I'm going to go ahead for the front door and uh, give a big round of applause. So, okay, got a question about lockdown. Can't answer that now. I really want to sh want to um, um, shut down. Can you this is the operative word now. We're going to have a lockdown of this live stream now as we all go out to um, applaud the NHS. Good night. Stay safe. Happy investing. And remember, there is going to be terrific opportunity because we've got a recession. I love recessions. Uh, and and.